Thank you for inviting me to this seminar. And we used to have this tradition of invading each other's seminar. Somehow we stopped doing that, right? The last time I have done it like five years ago and, and never since. So uh, we should really start, restart this tradition. And so I'm, I'm happy to invade you guys this. I, I suggest we try to change the name of that. Uh, ah, that's a good idea, yes. <laughs> in, in, in the current circumstances, that's a, what, what, what is the right name for it? <laughs> Exchange program. Exchange program. Yeah, exchange, yeah. Something peaceful. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a very good idea. Thank you. Better. All right. So uh, I'd like to uh, tell you about what I've been actually excited about that in the last year or so. So the title is Some Exact Results in QC Like and Color Gauge Theories. I've already produced quite a few number of papers in this, uh, uh, along this line of work. And now the pointer is not working. Okay, so uh, I've been working with uh, quite a number of people, and the main message is, is this. So the supersymmetric gauge theories, uh, at least some of them, have been solved exactly by Cyborg and company in the 90s, and solved in this case is not sort of a, like exactly solvable models, but, but try to understand the modular space of vacua, low energy spectrum, and so on and so forth. But the supersymmetric QCD is still quite far removed from the real world. So what I'm trying to do is adding small supersymmetry breaking using a specific way called anomaly mediation. And it turns out that that still allows for an exact solution as long as SUSY breaking is small. And of course, we don't know if uh, that would actually persist all the way up to infinite SUSY breaking where you'd like to be. But anyway, so that's the idea. Yes, Rafael. Right. Yeah, yeah. So what, what Cyborg and company did is to basically understand the vacuum structure, what symmetry is broken, what symmetry is preserved, what are the low energy degrees of freedom, rather than working out, for example, entire spectrum of bound states. So in the case of like a exactly so over two dimensional models, you do get in, entire information of all the poles and bound so states and so on and so forth. Things. So somebody in the chat just told us about it. I, yeah, I think there's two units here, so they can oh. see. Okay? Okay, now probably. Okay. All right. Yeah, so, so, this, so in two dimensional exactly solvable models, you get this full set of information about the entire theory. In the case of the cyborg and Witten kind of results, you only get information about the low energy limits. So that's why I, I put solved in double quotation mark. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so you get all the, the low energy masses. Are right. So uh, basically that you understand the universality class of the theory. And the, ones, so the idea is that uh, you can actually solve this uh, the, the, uh, SUSY QCD non-perturbatively and exactly as long as SUSY breaking is small. And we hope to learn something about the non-SUSY limit from that. And again, I'm having a problem. OK. So uh, I would like to in particular understand things like chirosymmetry breaking, monopole condensation confinement. So this is the kind of homework results from Cyborg Whitney in the 90s. And, and another thing is that the solving chiral gauge theories had been so far proven to be to totally elusive. Even the data simulation is not possible for chiral gauge theories. And we actually live in chiral gauge theories. Standard model is one of them. But we don't know even how to regularize it. So uh, it turns out that in this uh, technique, you can solve the chiral gauge theories exactly too. So that's why this, I believe, is a useful tool. But there are still some loose ends, and I welcome your input on that. So how exactly this small SUSY breaking will connect to the large SUSY breaking where we'd like to be is still an issue in some cases, and I'd like to be totally honest about that. Anyway, let me start with the introduction. So the question is really try to understand. Yes? Um, so, right, so what you can do is as long as SUSY breaking effect is much smaller compared to the dynamical scale of the gauge theory, you can solve the system exactly. At least you understand the low energy uh, theory uh, exactly. And what you can hope is that as you jack up SUSY breaking, you lose theoretical control. 
But in the spirit of the universality class, as long as there's no phase transition in between, then you at least learn something on the symmetry and order parameter and, and uh, low energy spectrum of the theory. So that's the hope. Uh -huh. this would be great. Are there phase no. Ah, uh, well, you, you might say there's a phase transition because the uh, symmetry structure does change, and you will see that explicitly in a few minutes. And yet it can still yeah, so it turns out that zero Susie breaking and small and finite Susie breaking show different symmetries. Yeah. But once the su supersymmetry breaking is finite and, and start increasing it, uh, in, in, in some cases, at least I see no signs of phase transitions. Yeah, that's the non-trivial P, of course, yeah, yeah. And that's, I would like to show that explicitly. Thank you for the questions. Okay, so I have a little lengthy introduction. So the question is really about solving QCD. And I still remember when, when I was learning about the, uh, the gauge theories back in grad school. You know, I, I felt like I was being cheated. So what do you get told in, in textbook? Okay, look at this proton. Then there are actually colorful, beautiful quarks in there. But I tell you, you can't never see them. You can never take them out. But believe me, it's in there. And it sounds like an internet scan to me. So uh, uh, I, I actually happen to have one copy of an internet scan still in my inbox. But anyway, so that's not the way I felt. And of course, what do you get told next is that, well, you know, this, this scam has a name called confinement. And once you actually have a name for it, you start to take it a little bit seriously because it's a technical term. And the next thing you get, you get told is that, well, you know, confinement is something we can prove, but it's at least plausible, because already experimentally we see that coupling constant QCD decreases at high energies and increases towards the low energies, so at least becomes strongly coupled. But still, it doesn't mean it's confined, because strong coupled theories exist without confining behavior. It could be conformal, for example. So it doesn't tell you that that's exactly what you're supposed to see from this theory. So this is only suggestive. And there's another puzzle. If you look at the spectrum of these bound states in QCD, proton is something we're made of, and pion is made of the same stuff, but for some reason, pion is much smaller than proton. So uh, that's actually mysterious. And, and actually, this, the fact that pion is much smaller than proton is important for our existence. Because looking at the spectrum of the hadrons, here's pion. Here are some other bound states, including protons and neutrons. There's a wide gap in between. And according to Yukawa, this is actually the reason why we exist. Because the range of the force between nucleon uh, done by the pion exchange goes like inverse mass of the pion mass. So if the pion is as, as heavy as the proton, then the range of the strong force becomes short, so short range that it doesn't go over from one proton to the next proton a nuclei wouldn't bind. Then there's no chemistry. The only atom in the universe would be hydrogen. So it's crucial that pion is much lighter compared to other, uh, other hadronic bound states so that we could exist. And of course, you know, people didn't stop here because the people started to come up with explanations behind all this. There's some qualitative picture that emerged about confinement that actually due to our late colleague, uh, Stanley Mandelstam, uh, called dual Meitner effect. Namely that in the usual superconductors, it is the electric charges that condense, the Cooper pairs, and that causes the magnetic field to be confined into the flux tubes, a of flux. And that's why, the, for example, we have this uh, magnet floating on, uh, a superconductor floating a piece of magnet. So that's the idea of the charge condensation making uh, uh, the magnetic field confined in flux tubes. So what uh, Stanley's told us is that if you have a system where actually magnetic monopoles condense instead. And that's the dual, the dual of the electromagnetic exchanging electric and magnetic. So then you would expect that the electric flux, uh, the electric field gets confined into flux tubes. So in that situation, if you have a quark here and an anti-quark there, there's an electric field in between, but it doesn't spread out, it gets confined into this tube. Then the energy of this uh, electric field will be proportional to the length namely uh, the distance between quark and antiquark, and that's how you get the potential energy linear in distance, and that's the confinement. So that 
actually makes us feel a little bit sort of uh, familiar because we have system we can study in the laboratory that exhibits similar behavior. But still, you, can, you haven't answered the question, is there even monopole at all in gauge theory? And why does it condense? So this is still not quite there yet. And in terms of pi on B much lighter than proton, of course, this is another thing we learn in textbooks. So in the massless limit of the QCD, you have an extended symmetry called the chiral symmetry. And if you assume that the chiral symmetry is broken to diagonal subgroup, then you get the number of Goldstone bosons, and you can identify pions as a number of Goldstone bosons for the symmetry breaking. So at least in this limit, you have an understanding that pion is supposed to be even massless. Even if you put in the ex explicit mass down for the quarks, so the symmetry is explicitly broken, at least you understand the reason pi why pion is light, so that the nuclei would bang. So that actually makes us feel better. But then uh, we still haven't answered the question why this symmetry breaks to the diagonal subgroup, namely the issue of chiral symmetry breaking. So that's still not quite explained. So we haven't derived these points, which kind of makes sense, but haven't derived this exact, uh, directly from QCD. And things got even better, again, thanks to another late Berkeley colleague, Bruno Zumino, who invented supersymmetry. And by putting a supersymmetry together with the gauge theory, the cyborg Witten developed this idea back in the 90s that if you have the two supersymmetries, then the gauge theory, in this case, the SU2 gauge theory, has a moduli space of vacua given by this order parameter called the, uh, the U. That's the, just the VEV of the adjoint chiral superfield in a way that the VEV is 1 minus 1. Then, then U1 is unbroken, so you have a Coulomb phase. And in this Coulomb phase, they showed us that there are singularities where you identify actually massless monopoles. So when you break SU2 to U1 because of this uh, order parameter, then you have this whole polyg of monopole, which is typically heavy. But the mass goes like the VEV of the symmetry breaking over the gauge coupling constant. But if you close into the origin of this moduli space, the coupling becomes stronger and stronger. So it makes sense the monopole becomes lighter and lighter. And then they have demonstrated the monopoles do become exactly massless at two points on the moduli space. So at that point, then you have this uh, effective Lagrangian that the monopole whose mass vanish when this order parameter is the, that given by dynamical scale. And if you, on top of it, add a small perturbation to the system that n equal two supersymmetry is broken to n equal one by adding a mass to one of the gauge genus, not both of the gauge genus, but one of the gauge genus, hence breaking n equal two to n equal one, you can immediately solve the superpotential by differentiating w with respect to u and set it to zero, then mu minus n plus n minus should vanish, and therefore monopole field would acquire VEV are given by square root of mu. So in this case, you can really show the monopoles, first of all, exist and condense, and therefore causing confinement. And you can even break it further to no supersymmetry as well, but it doesn't change the, uh, uh, the qualitative feature at all. But when you actually come to the question whether you can demonstrate chiral symmetry breaking, it turns out that n equal to two supersymmetry is not very useful because you have this particular superpotential required by n equal to supersymmetry, which already breaks chiral symmetry down to the vector diagonal uh, symmetry. So you don't have chiral symmetry to begin with, and therefore you can talk about how its chiral symmetry is broken dynamically. So that was the end of the story. When you go to n equal one supersymmetry, the less supersymmetry, that was the case when study, uh, studied uh, in detail by Cyborg and, and his collaborators, it turns out that you can still solve the problem, solve in the sense that we talked about with double quotation, but it turns out that that solution doesn't seem to resemble the real world at all, and it's actually very weird, and so it has many unusual faces which doesn't seem to correspond to the real world. So in the case of SUN gauge theories, so this actually turned out to be the picture. So when you have SUN gauge theories with certain number of flavors for SUNC gauge group, and when the number of flavor is small, then you actually don't have the ground state. And the theory has a runaway behavior. 
And that's certainly not what you would expect with the non-supersymmetric QCD. We do ex expect well-defined ground state uh, of the, the quarks and, and gluons binding together, and we don't see that in cyborg solution. When you go up to a slightly larger number of flavors, you again have rather weird phases. In this case, you have infinite number of ground states, and most of them end up breaking barrier number instead of the chiral symmetry we want. If you go to further uh, larger number of flavors, it turns out that theory seems to confine, but doesn't break chiral symmetry. If you go up to uh, even larger number of the flavors, you get into this very weird phase that the quarks seem to get confined into baryons, but baryons fragment into the smaller pieces called dual quarks, and they have a new type of gauge interactions uh, acting on them. And if you go to even larger number of flavors, you find infrared fixed points in theory uh, runs into conformal regime. And for, for number of flavors greater than 3 and C becomes infrared free. So that's what we learned from uh, Nadi Cyberg. And none of them seem to resemble the real world. This is SUN vector like gauge theory. SUN vector like gauge theory. But this behavior is pretty much the same also for SON and SPN or classical groups. But what we know, on the other hand, in non supersymmetric limit is rather limited. So when the number of flavors is really, really large, it becomes infrared free, you, the beta function becomes positive. And when you are really on the edge, just below this point, then you can show that there is actually a fixed point when you have the cancellation between sort of uh, uh, the, the leading uh, the beta function and the set two loop beta function. And when you are only slightly below this point, there's a cancellation that this coefficient happens to be small. But there's no reason why the two loop piece is small at the same time. Then you find that you have the fixed point of the beta function with perturbative gauge coupling, which is 1 over nc. Then you can convince yourself that this is indeed an infrared fixed point of the theory. But once you start to move away from this point, you really don't know much about it. We know, mostly from experimental data, that down below you do have color symmetry breaking. And that is simulations uh, uh, does reproduce this behavior so that we are quite uh, happy uh, down there. But in between, we know very little. So that's the uh, situation we, we have right now after all these years. And what I'm trying to tell you today that when you have this range where you don't have any ground state in supersymmetric limit, but once you turn on that tiny supersymmetry breaking, you can show that there is now a ground state, which does correspond to the standard color symmetry breaking. And we don't know if this is continuously connected to what you are supposed to see in non suzy limit, but at least we can hope so. At least this is one approach you can make. And I don't see any signs that th there's any qualitative change between this small but finite Susie breaking to infinite Susie breaking. So it does seem to be connected. I'm sorry? Can you say again what this one over means of not having a ground state? Yeah, so the, the, uh, the effective potential of this theory looks something like this. You have some order parameter, which I call m. Here's the potential energy. And potential energy looks like this. So it keeps run away uh, to infinity, and there's no well-defined ground state anywhere. But it turns out that once you turn on supersymmetry breaking, this potential changes to this. It does develop a, a well-defined minimum with still large field, but it's a well-defined minimum. Then at that minimum, you see all the right behaviors for the chiral symmetry breaking. So that's going to show up in two, two slides or so. Okay? It's hard for that as it's uh, not growing down to control with the perturbative Yeah, so yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, given that the vacuum happens to be at the large field values, you can trust your, uh, the Kähler potential being nearly uh, the, the, the canonical. And then there is a self consistency of the analysis. I, I mentioned that more explicitly in a couple of slides. And when you go to larger number of flavors, again, I do find the minima with the chiral symmetry breaking. But this is when I, I'm still at the, the working on some loose ends. There seem to be multiple minima of the theories. 
and how exactly each minimum is connected to non suzy limit is something we are yet to quite understand. But nonetheless, we do see a consistent minimum with the chiral symmetry breaking all the way up to 3NC. So our conjecture then is that in non suzy gauge theories, you do have this range of chiral symmetry breaking all the way up to this kind of large number that is actually consistent with what people seem to simulate on the lattice for a small number of NC. But uh, as I said, uh, we have so, still some loose ends we have to tie up and, 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 and understand. So let me uh, start my discussion today with this N equal one QCD, starting with the Cyborg's results. And most schemes people have tried to introduce Susie breaking didn't quite work out because of the lack of the, uh, sufficient predictive power. But the one way of doing so using anomaly mediation seems to be uniquely suited for this purpose, thanks to the property called UV insensitivity. I'm going to explain that in a couple of slides. And even with infinitesimal uh, SUSY breaking uh, done this way, the theory collapses to the expectation of the non SUSY QCD, namely chiral symmetry breaking. So it tur turns out that this combination of starting with N equal 1 SUSY together with the normal immediate supersymmetry breaking seems to be a great tool to study non suzy gauge theories in four dimensions. And once you at least buy into this idea, you want to apply it uh, to uh, other theories like uh, chiral gauge theories and understand its dynamics too. So anyway, this way we can now finally quote unquote derive uh, chiral symmetry breaking from QCD. So I don't know if I can go through the, the whole list of things, but let me get started anyway. Uh, with a brief review of what this anomaly media supersymmetry breaking is. This is a, that's something I proposed back in 98, and it so, does seem to satisfy our needs. Namely, we'd like to connect this beautiful world of N equal 1 supersymmetry to the dirty real world of non suzy gauge theories. And uh, we have to, of course, for the purpose, decouple the gauge genos and squawks we don't have in QCD. And so what that means is that you need to introduce supersymmetry breaking so that you add finite masses to gauge genos and squawks. But if you do this arbitrarily, then you lose theoretical control because the language the cyborg used to describe the results of Suzy gauge theories was in terms of composite objects like baryons and mesons. And when you actually turn on mass to the constituents, what kind of mass the composite state acquires is actually a non-trivial question. We know, for example, that when you turn on the mass of the quark, pi O mass grows like square root of the quark mass. So it doesn't go linearly with the constituent mass. So we need to have some understanding how the composites would respond to the effects of super, uh, supersymmetry breaking. So we need to have some non-perturbative non control on this. And so uh, that's, that's what we need to do. And uh, people did try by turning on, for example, gauge genome mass alone but without scalar masses. And the gauge genome mass is something that appears together with the gauge coupling constant in the same super multiplet. This is the gauge genome mass. And you can hope that there's some control because everything has to be in this holomorphic combination. For example, the dynamical scale then acquires a piece that corresponds to supersymmetry breaking. So that's good. But on the other hand, when you try to solve for the minimum of the potential, not only that you need have super potential, which you have some non perturbative control, but you need to know something about the Kähler potential as well. And when you write the Kähler potential, it doesn't have to be holomorphic, can be arbitrary function of this combination. And you can start writing terms like this one. Then you even don't have a control on the sign of this term. And you don't know if, the, if, if you don't know the sign of the mass, uh, the, the mass squared of the scalar fields, you don't know if there's a condensate or not, and you don't understand the universality class. And so they try to avoid this problem by turning on the mass of the quark so that this sign ambiguity doesn't matter in the end. But if you do that, then you have broken chiral symmetry already, so you can ask the question whether dynamics breaks chiral symmetry. So that's actually not good. But we, we have some examples where we have control uh, thanks to external symmetry. And that's the idea called Spurion, and that's what we did actually do really in terms of the, uh, uh, the QCD. So the, we know the QCD Lagrangian, and if you actually put in, uh, don't, don't put in a mass for the quarks, you have this larger symmetry called SUNF left cross SUNF right, because different chiralities would break up in their uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the kinetic terms. 
And then this mass down for the quarks is, is a fixed number, but you pretend that this mass down transforms as the bifundamentals of this uh, uh, chiral symmetry. If you do so, then you can tell how this parameter can enter the low energy Lagrangian, which is described in terms of these composite fields, because this composite field is also a bifundamental under this symmetry. And then you know exactly what the, is the combination you can write between this quark mass parameter and this chiral Lagrangian field U. And from this, you obtain this, the, the, the prediction that the mass of the pion squared grows with linearly with the quark mass and so on and so forth. So in this case, by switching from UV description to IR description, external symmetry tells you how symmetry breaking parameters couples in the low energy theory. So that's the idea we rely on. And even better, if external symmetry turns out to be you know, space-time symmetry, you get even well, more mileage in, in writing down low energy theory. For example, suppose you are, you, you are considering QCD some background metric, like Schwarzschild metric, and you know exactly how the uh, background metric would couple to your uh, UV Lagrangian. And then you go to the IR description of it for the chiral Lagrangian, and you know exactly, again, how the chiral Lagrangian would couple to the background space-time, because that's dictated by the general coordinate invariance. So if you have a space-time symmetry, that's actually even more powerful. So it turns out this uh, particular scheme called anomaly media supersymmetry breaking relies on this idea so that you know how non-perturbatively uh, even the uh, supersymmetry breaking effects appear in low energy Lagrangian. So the idea is that you have supersymmetry breaking happening somewhere in your theory, which doesn't uh, uh, couple directly to the standard model. So you break supersymmetry by this, uh, uh, the order parameter of the F component of some field. You need to make sure, of course, the, uh, the cosmological constant vanishes on this scale. Uh, you may, of course, generate that at very low energies, but at this scale, it has to vanish. So you have both F and W uh, uh, as an order parameter here. And because I don't connect directly the dynamics of Suzy breaking to the gauge theory of my interest, the only impact goes through gravity. Then with supersymmetry, of course, there has to be supergravity. And in supergravity, there's a superpartner of the graviton, namely gravitino with spin, uh, spin three halves. And it is known that the gravitino acquires a mass through this expectation value of the superpotential. And once the uh, supergravity is broken, that would also induce Suzy breaking effects in the gauge theory of your interest. And now that the, gauge, uh, the gravitino acquires a mass, there is a parameter proportional to the same parameter, which is suppressed by Planck scale squared, which controls the size of supersymmetry breaking in that theory. And uh, not having any interaction between the two sectors, only effect comes from gravity, then the impact of the Suzy breaking is completely well predicted. And uh, the way you would describe this in terms of formulation is, is called the wild compensator. So in some sense, this is sort of the supersymmetric generalization of square root minus g. And inside square root minus g, you have this four supergravity multiplet, and there's an auxiliary field, which is called the y compensator. So the way, exactly, way this compensator appears in Lagrangian is completely dictated by the supergravity invariance. And the impact of this uh, supersymmetry breaking is to assume that there's this f component in this uh, y compensator field, and this is the only parameter. So you know exactly how this little m enters the Lagrangian uh, from the supergravity uh, invariance, uh, 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 it, it turns out. So and it, turns, and it also turns out that if this uh, theory has a conformal invariance, namely, for example, if w is a dimensionless coupling lambda times phi cubed, that's the Vesumino model, then looking at this form of the Lagrangian, you can do the scaling to absorb dependence on this uh, the wild compensator completely into the definition of this chiral superfield, so the Suzy breaking completely disappears. So if the theory is conformal, there is no Suzy breaking in this framework. But if you actually have some dimension full parameter in the theory, like the mass term, and the cubic term can absorb three power of epsilon. But this term fails to do so, there's one, uh, one power left. So as a result, the mass parameter would acquire supersymmetry breaking. 
so that if you have a massive spectrum, fermion stays at the same mass, but the boson would split. And that's the effect of supersymmetry breaking. So the idea is that this type of supersymmetry breaking couples only when the theory has dimension four parameter in the theory, including the dynamical scale of the gauge theory. So this is the way the supersymmetry breaking effect appears non-perturbatively through the dy dynamical scale of the gauge theory, but you have a complete control on how exactly that would appear, and that's the advantage of using this scheme of supersymmetry breaking. So uh, as a, a general formula in the end is that when the, the superpotential is cubic, it is supposed to vanish, indeed it does, but when you have this quadratic term, this is two minus three, it doesn't vanish. So this turns out to be the general formula for the impact of supersymmetry breaking. But even when the theory appears to be conform at the classical level, then uh, you can still have the uh, trace anomaly. The conformal invariance can be broken through the renormalization effect. When you have, for example, the uh, kinetic term with a wave function organization which runs as a function of the renormalization scale, you need to then extend this mass scale, like the cutoff scale, also according to the same rule of the anomaly mediation by putting supersymmetry breaking effects in there. If you expand this out, you can pick up terms which contain this epsilon in it, and that will give you this coupling of phi and f, which is called a trilinear coupling, and this is actually the SUSY breaking mass squared, which is completely predicted by the wave function minimization factor or anomalous dimension. So you find the potential given by that one. Sorry. Somehow. Uh, okay, back to this. And, and then you have a prediction on the what kind of supersymmetry breaking is induced uh, from the loop level. Uh, of course, as long as the, you can have, uh, uh, you, you, you are in some weakly coupled regime in the description. An interesting thing about this prediction is that the SUSY breaking effects are given in terms of the, the anomalous dimension, which is determined by the loops of particles that are present at the energy scale of interest. It doesn't matter what's going on on the ultra high energy scale. You decouple all of these particles, integrate them out, because they don't contribute to the running at the energy scale of your interest. And that's the property we call the UV insensitivity. And that's very powerful because the only information you need to know to understand how supersymmetry breaking works is the physics at that energy scale of your interest. In the case of the Cyborg's result, then everything is reduces down to low energy description in terms of the, some low energy degrees of freedom. But you can directly apply this idea <coughs> to read off what kind of SUSY breaking effects there are in the low energy limit, and hence this is actually very uh, uh, predictive and theoretically powerful. And the same thing uh, is also true with the gauge genome masses. So again, you have the running of gauge coupling constant, but the cutoff scale acquires the SUSY breaking effects. If you expand that in theta squared, there appears the gauge genome mass which is again predicted by the beta function, again the running effects, because that's a violation of the conformal invariance. So gauge genome mass then is predicted in terms of the beta function, so that's the prediction of a normal mediation. Yes, Raphael. Uh, yeah, cutoff scale is meant to be very high, yeah. and SUSY breaking scale is meant to be tiny. So the running, yeah, the running is the from the cutoff scale to the energy scale of your interest. And the cutoff can be represented, for example, like pauli villas regulator in your Lagrangian. That's the mass term. And as I told you, the mass term actually does acquire no, no. supersymmetry breaking. Yeah. And so uh, if you keep track of this epsilon dependence of the, the pauli villas mass, then that appears in the running effects, both for the, uh, the, the wave function organization in the running coupling constant. Yes, better. Yeah, 
Yes? That would be of the order of uh, 10 to the 10th GeV to the fourth power. Right, so too large, <laughs> way too large. So it's not quite Planck to the fourth power, but it's sort of a halfway in between. So you solve the cosmological constant problem only halfway on the log scale. Okay, so once again, you see this behavior that the Susie breaking effects is determined by the physics of the energy scale of your interest. And if you think that sounds too good to be true, you can demonstrate it. Suppose you, inc you include some heavy fields uh, of mass m. And when you integrate out this heavy field, then the beta function all of a sudden changes. But it turns out that integrating on this heavy field, together with this uh, Suzy breaking effect, correctly introduces the threshold correction at this energy scale, which precisely corresponds to the gap on how much beta function changes. So it turns out that this statement is true whether you are above the scale, the mass scale, or below the mass scale of this heavy particle. So this formula remains true on both sides of the threshold. And you can do the same thing uh, also for the scalar mass squared. You, you can't really see this diagram, it's kind of too shiny. But anyway, you can demonstrate the same thing, that you generate threshold corrections precisely in such a way that you uh, 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 compensate the jump in the, this anomalous dimension and that's something I did with the, uh, the, the, my students a long time ago. So it turns out that this UV insensitivity does appear to be true, and you can demonstrate that at the perturbative level. But because everything's based on just the, the fact that every, uh, the theory has to be supergravity invariant, then of course it has to be true non perturbatively as well. And uh, one day, actually, I received an email from Steven Weinberg uh, back when he was still uh, uh, healthy. And he asked questions about anomaly mediation. And, and what I learned from Lawrence, uh, who actually used to work with Lucien Weinberg at Harvard a long time ago, is that Steve sometimes appeared to be rather stupid and too naive because he asked really basic questions. And that was the case uh, uh, this time too. So I got an email about this question that, you know, we, we, you, you have this formula, the gauge genome mass is given times beta function, the beta function runs, gauge genome mass doesn't run, how could this be true? And of course, I had to politely respond by telling him that, well, there is something called the running mass. The mass parameter can be also defined in a way that actually runs in the mass independent realization scale and blah, blah, blah. Of course, he must have known all of that, but nonetheless, he asked this question. And he went silent, but a week later, he came up with another question which was now very deep, getting into all the subtle issues about the definition of the parameters and renormalization scale and all that stuff, which I could barely respond, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, you know, that's apparently the way he was. But he started with really naive and fresh look at things. But at the end of the day, he thinks through these issues so deeply that he understands things better than anybody at the end of the day. So that is the way apparently he was. So I was very happy after this uh, brief exchange that when Steve wrote this third volume of the quantum field theory textbook, you know, I was thanked in here together with Lawrence Hall and Bruno Zumino. And the Berkeley has the institution with the largest number of people being thanked in this volume. So <laughs> you should be happy about that. And so definitely there is a section on anomaly media supersymmetry breaking. Okay, now we come to the main part of the talk. So let's dive into the SU and gauge theory. So as I told you already, when the number of flavor is small, according to Cybrook, you describe the space at lowest degrees of freedom using this meson field. And you have this potential, which has this negative power in this meson field. And that's this runaway behavior I, I drew on the blackboard. So the theory doesn't have ground state and certainly doesn't resemble what we expect in non suzy QCD. But when you, you turn on the gauge cup, uh, the uh, supersymmetry breaking, you know exactly how that appears in this description using this composite field because here is the energy scale. And energy scale acquires supersymmetry breaking. So that's the idea of anomaly mediation. So you know exactly how that appears, namely Susie breaking effect M will give you this potential for this meson field M. And then you have this whole consistency so while this Susie breaking scale is finite but infinitesimal, 
you still have this more or less runaway behavior that the meson field turns on to a very large value. So you know that. But when the meson field is very large compared to dynamical scale, you can actually understand this meson field to be made of the, uh, the, the direction where Q and Q twiddle are the same, called D flat direction, where gauge uh, group is completely broken at high energy scale, where theory is actually perturbative, it turns out. And when the theory is perturbative, then you have the canonical Kähler potential for this quark and anti-quark fields. And once you know that, you can write down the complete potential, including Susy breaking effects. And it's not difficult to imagine that Susy breaking effect would produce a minimum at large value with this mostly runaway behavior, but the slight tilt due to Susy breaking. So potential looks like this, produce a well-defined minimum. But at this minimum, the meson field turns on with this chronic delta, which means that you do break this uh, chiral symmetry down to diagonal subgroup. You can compute what the VEV is. And then you have proven chiral symmetry break breaking. And, and in, when chiral symmetry, of course, breaks, you have the massless pions as a prediction of the theory, uh, just like what Nambu told us a long time ago. And uh, of course, the pion comes in a super multiplet. So you have actually uh, Messino fermion in addition to meson. And in, in this description, it turns out that these mesinos satisfy all of the anomaly matching condition. That's one of the reasons why we believe this description. And when you integrate out these mesinos, which now acquire the mass of Theodore supersymmetry breaking, because these guys carry anomalies, that would generate vestumino witten term for the pion fields. Then you generate a complete Cairo Lagrangian out of this description. So the Cairo Lagrangian is now derived instead of postulated, in which I believe is a major progress in understanding. And also, in case when NF equal 1, where you don't have U1 chiral symmetry here, so, so that's a special case, you don't expect any number Goldstone boson. And lo and behold, if you actually do the analysis for NF equal 1 case, then this direction is a single uh, uh, the chiral superfield. So everything now is massive along this direction. You don't find any Goldstone boson, and that's exactly what you expect because of the lack of chiral symmetry. So everything seems to work out com completely consistently as we expect in the non susy limit. If you go to higher number of flavors, things get a little bit more complicated and you have this quantum modified moduli space and I don't dwell too much on it. You have to rely a little bit on extra input, uh, uh, what is called a naive dimensional analysis to understand the dynamics. But once again, you see this minimum of the chiral symmetry breaking. And that's the case with the three number of flavors for SU3 color. And that's the realistic situation we expect in non supersymmetric uh, QCD. You indeed find massless pions and massive baryons. And that's exactly what we expect. And when you go to even higher number of uh, 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 flavors, uh, I, uh, you can do the analysis with this non perturbative superpotential which Cyber came up with. And this potential basically looks like this red which leads to the origin of the field space because of the positive power. But sort of the opposite from what we did in, in this lower number of flavors, in this case, this composite field, meson and baryon, are what saturates the Tooth anomaly matching conditions. So near the origin, we expect that meson and baryon composite fields have the canonical Kähler potential. At least it's regular near the origin. And when you stick in this Susie breaking effect, on top of this non perturbative superpotential, which looks like this, that would tilt the potential this way, so it does develop a minimum. But as long as this M is small, the minimum is actually suppressed by the small Susy breaking, so it is close to the origin. That's where the Kähler potential has to be regular. Therefore, once again, you have a full theoretical control in writing down this potential energy, so you trust this minimum. And again, you have this chiral symmetry breaking, and you find massless pions, and so on and so forth. The loose ends we are now working on is, is even for higher number of flavors, where you switch to what is called the free magnetic theory. And you can actually work out this, uh, the, uh, the chiral symmetry breaking in this case as well. And you find a, uh, this behavior of the potential, and everything is self-consistent and you can work out the minimum and so on and so forth. I don't go through the, all the algebra in here. 
But the loose end I, 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 uh, we are now working on is that there may be the deeper minimum where barrier number uh, is broken. And which one is the right minimum with smoothly connected non the limit is something we are trying to understand. This seems to be a special case of SUN gauge theories because that doesn't appear for SP and SO gauge theories. So something specific to baryon directions, which are there only for SUN gauge theories. So we are still trying to uh, tie up this loose end, but nonetheless, overall picture seems consistent. And uh, when I was giving this talk, uh, on one point, the, uh, 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 I, I was asked the question that, you know, you claim you have de derived chirosymmetry breaking, but all the parameter of the chirosymmetry breaking is the fermion bilinear, not the meson scalar field. But it turns out that this fermion bilinear can be computed too, because in the UV description, this meson field has this theta squared component, which precisely co corresponds to this fermion bilinear. So in the low energy description, you know what the minimum is, and you can compute the F component of the meson superfield. That should correspond to the fermion bilinear. So if you work it out, then quark, squark bilinear is given by this. Quark bilinear is given by the same combination times SUSY breaking, it turns out. So behavior is something like this. For SU3 gauge theory, the two flavors, this is the case of this runaway behavior. So the squawk wave is large at the beginning. As you jack up the supersymmetry breaking, it starts to go down. On the other hand, quark bilinear field is proportional to SUSY breaking here, so it starts with zero and starts to go up. But eventually, they cross, and squawk bilinear gets suppressed, and quark bilinear is the dominant uh, order parameter. So again, everything seems to be smoothly connected from infinitesimal SUSY breaking to infinite SUSY breaking. And that's also true with the higher number of flavors. You know, power is different, but again, there seems to be a continuation of the phases from small SUSY breaking to large SUSY breaking. So what I'm telling you now is that at least in this region, the only minimum is the one with the chirosymmetry breaking, which seems to be continuously connected to the non suzy limit. In this range, there are multiple minima, which we are still analyzing it, but at least there is a local minimum with well-defined chirosymmetry breaking, and all the properties seem to carry over smoothly to non suzy limit. So this is the best we can say at this moment, but at least we are learning something about the non suzy limit by studying the theory which you can solve exactly with infinitesimal SUSY breaking added to the Cyborg's results, and that's the main claim. So let me pause here to see if there are any questions about this statement. Is, is everything okay? And one thing we are working also on this conformal window uh, is uh, a paper I actually have done with the undergrads. So in this case, conformal window has this large anomalous dimension fixed by the R charges of the fields. And it turns out that only having this uh, rather large anomalous dimension, you can work out, sorry, I'm skipping over some of the explanations here, but you can work out the, uh, 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 the theory. And in this case, you can compute, uh, for example, when you're close to the, the, the Banksack's fixed point limit, you can compute how the SUSY breaking effects would run and indeed reaches fixed point values in the end. So that's something you can demonstrate. And so the SUSY breaking effects, once they reach this conformal fixed point, they actually vanish because it's conformal. But the point is that the power, how quickly they vanish, is slower compared to how the theory runs into the conformal window, a uh, conformal limit, and therefore the SUSY breaking effects is actually relevant. It's not irrelevant. So even though the theory uh, in the SUSY limit becomes conformal in the infrared, with SUSY breaking, it doesn't reach conformal limit because SUSY breaking effects are relevant. And then you have to understand its consequence of dynamics. And, and once again, you can actually work it out by integrating out this uh, meson field, uh, sorry, uh, by going along the direction of the large meson field, you integrate out the dual quarks that generates non perturbative superpotential. You play the same game and you find a well defined minimum. So the chirosymmetry breaking minimum at least does exist. And once again, we are trying to understand the possibility of other minima. And now that I'm running out of time, 
let me just mention one more thing. Uh, if you actually go to SON gauge theory, it turns out that there is the number of flavors, which is NC minus two, where SONC is broken to SO2 or U1. So the theory actually has a Coulomb branch. And on the Coulomb branch, in this case, the cyborg told us, cyborg and intrigator told us, that there is also a monopole. And there are two singularities. One of them is at the origin where meson field vanishes, that singularity. And, and at this singularity, the dion fields become massless. But when you actually add the supersymmetry breaking effects on top of it, again, you can uh, uh, learn how supersymmetry breaking works thanks to UV insensitivity, anomaly mediation, and vacuum energy is actually quite a bit suppressed, even with a loop factor. But there is another singularity where this U order parameter actually is finite, where meson field does have a value. And again, you can compute the SUSY breaking effects where monopoles become massless. And then you find the monopoles do condense thanks to SUSY breaking. If you don't break SUSY, it's zero. But with SUSY breaking, it does condense. And the vacuum energy here is much deeper compared to this one. So this is the minimum we choose. Then what you find here is that in this case, monopole condenses, hence causing confinement. And monopole can condense precisely at the point where meson determinant doesn't vanish, which breaks chiral symmetry. So at this singularity, you understand both at the same time that theory confines and chiral symmetry breaks. And uh, you couldn't actually see this behavior in SUN gauge theories because if you have quarks in a fundamental representation, there is actually no uh, true sense of confinement, in, uh, uh, namely the area law of the Wilson loop. But in SON gauge theory with the, uh, the quarks in the vector representation, the Z2 center uh, carried by the spinner representation is not screened. So therefore, there's a well-defined meaning to the confinement. And precisely in this theory with the well-defined meaning of the confinement, we see this monopole condensation, so which actually does make sense. And once you understand the situation with NC minus two flavors, you can integrate additional flavors out, and you can show that monopole condensate and meson condensates persist down to smaller number of flavors, and hence confinement and chiral symmetry breaking at all number of flavors, at least below this value. For a high number of values, we still don't know how to work out the dynamics of monopole, so that's still limited. That's why we're still working on it. But, uh, but at least in the range of NF up to NC minus two, you do see monopole condensation as Stanley predicted and meson condensate as Nambu predicted uh, starting from the fundamental Lagrangian. Then the only thing I'd like to add then is uh, just one small fact about the chiral gauge theories. So this is actually something that appears in the old-fashioned grand unified theories. All the quarks leptons are unified into the spinner 16 representation of SO10 gauge group. And the reason why this is interesting is that according to one friend of mine who actually does a lot of QCD calculations, most likely candidate of chiral gauge theories to be simulated on the lattice anytime soon is this theory with SO10 with 16. And nobody managed to do this yet. That may happen, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20 years, and nobody know, really knows because it's a, such a difficult problem. Cairo th gauge theory had never been simulated on lattice. But it sort of makes sense that this may be the first one because SO10 is the smallest gauge group which is automatically anomaly free and admits chiral fermions. So if there's any theory that may be easy to simulate, it makes sense that this may be the one. And the one thing we have to do then is to first understand the SUSY limit uh, before turning on the SUSY breaking. And that had not been worked out before. But working with an undergraduate student, now we are actually working out dynamics of this theory. Case with only 116 is something I actually looked at a while ago, and that's the dynamics of the break supersymmetry. When you have two or three flavors, nobody had worked it out before, but now we understand how that works at the SUSY limit. And the, the case of 316, and, uh, and you again have this runaway behavior. But runaway behavior is made of a matrix uh, which is the four times composite of 16. 
And when you turn on suzy braking, you again develop the well-defined minimum. And that minimum breaks the SU3 flavor symmetry among 316s down to SO3. So if it comes to the point that people can simulate cardio gauge theories, this will be a prediction, and in principle, they can test that idea. And so I'm hopeful. And, and as I said, we can't really prove that uh, the, the phases are continuously connected from finite uh, tiny SUSY breaking to infinite SUSY breaking. But at least what we have learned from the uh, known examples seems to be uh, uh, actually giving us the consistent picture uh, between two limits. So I can be hopeful on that. So anyway, so this is a quick summary of the, the everything I talked about. Thank you for your attention. And you also see BCTP is a great place to be, right? <laughs> yes, better. Ah, ah, okay. Huh? It seems to me, uh, I was curious, if you take stem slightly non zero and then try to carefully take the n equal to zero uh -huh. continuously, that limit will reproduce the drug behavior, right? That's, That's right. Operate. So, because the minimum is here, yeah. and if you turn off m, uh, then it just keeps going to the infinite values. Right, so it looks like these are connected. It's a smooth limit, so it's yeah. even though the symmetry changes, mm -hmm. it's only like there are two different brands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I don't see any inconsistency with this picture. So that's, that's, uh, I guess, clarifies that we're Yeah, that's reassuring, isn't it? Yeah, so at least I don't see any jump, right? So that's the thing that's important. And for the larger number of flavors, I also showed that uh, in this case, the SUSY limit is, is near the origin, and non SUSY minimum is also small uh, uh, when SUSY, a small SUSY breaking limit. So once you actually turn off, then this always goes back to the origin. So again, it's smoothly connected. No, <laughs> I'm not a string theorist, so I don't know how to do that. Well, if you, it would be great if you could think about this. We should talk about that. But it would be fascinating to see what is the smallest number of modes that you can actually isolate and see the loyalties. Yeah, for example, I think KKLT would produce a similar setup for this. So uh, uh, there may be a way of actually working that out, indeed. So what we need is, is this situation, that we have the full predictive power on how SUSY breaking appears non-perturbatively. So uh, if you can engineer this SUSY breaking maybe with KKLT, and you have the gauge theory on sort of in the bulk region where it's far away from the antibrains. Maybe you can have a way of working that out. Well, of course, you know the the Hiroshi and and the Kamran graph don't don't think that works. So it remains to be seen. <laughs> It would be great to see that, yeah. So let's talk about that. Well, this is the purpose of, we don't call this invasion anymore, uh, exchange program, that we cr create new collaborations. Yes. I have a very naive question, Go ahead. actually. 
So what is the difficulty of doing the Cairo theories on the lattice? Like what is the technical difficulty? Because I remember, for instance, that doing like real time dynamics uh -huh. is hard on the lattice. But what well, is the so uh, that you can start with this idea that suppose you try to uh, regularize theory in the continuum first before going to even lattice. Mm -hmm. And you can do even simple poly veloc because fermions are Cairo, you can add big mass term. And, if, and, and the next thing you might want to try is dimension regularization. Uh -huh. But for Cairo gauge theory, gamma 5 is essential. Mm -hmm. Gamma 5 is intrinsically four-dimensional object. So it doesn't work with dimensional regularization, at least naively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then people went to dimensional reduction regularization and so on and so forth. And you have to at least see already difficulties even in the continuum theory. It's not like right. the lattice Right. And uh, if you go to lattice, there's a famous fermion double problem that you have multiple fermion species appearing. Mm -hmm. And in chiral gauge theories, each species would be chiral uh, opposite. If one is chiral, the other one is anti-chiral. So that leads to vector-like theory instead of chiral theory you want. And, and you can actually lift mass for one of them because, again, chiral prohibits from writing the mass term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you see right away that you have to do something non-trivial. Well, so that, uh, there, there is some conceptual breakthrough done by David B. Kaplan and Dorota, who used to be postdoc here, also worked with him on that. Uh, so uh, there is some, at least conceptual level, that you, they, have, they claim to have the formulation. And one of them actually relies on uh, lifting the four-dimensional theory to five dimensions. And you produce a kink solution in 5D direction. And on one of the kinks, you get chiral gauge theory. And the, uh, the anti-kink on the opposite end, you get anti chiral gauge theory. Together, it's still vector-like. But if the theory on one kink is consistent on its own, you can hope by separating two basic domain walls away from each other, the dynamics wouldn't communicate between those two. And that ends up simulating only the chiral portion of the theory. So that's at least one formulation people are hoping to work in the end. But practically, again, nobody has been able to do so. So with no other questions, let's thank Toshi again. Okay, thank you. Thank you.